period from the restoration of Charles II to the throne in 1660 to the middle of the 18th century is often characterized as the golden age of satire. Anti-Puritan satire had circulated during the interregnum under the Commonwealth government and reached its height with the publication of Samuel Butler's Hudibras, the first two parts of which were published in 1663 and 1664. But in general, it was characterized more by biting anger than by erudition and wit. In Charles's court, where his taste for ribaldry and ridicule, and where rivalry and political intrigues flourished, sophisticated court satires in manuscript circulated amongst private circles. From the mid-1660s, political satires targeting the king's new regime also began to circulate in both print and manuscript form. There was also a rise in town satire, as described by Harold Love, which was concerned with a new kind of identity and new patterns of behavior which are associated with the life of urban pleasure as it was lived in the newly settled squares of the West End, and with the hedonistic social round of the parks, the mall, the coffee and chocolate houses, the ordinaries, visits, bookshops, and theater going. The rise of party politics out of the successionist faction supporting the succession of Charles's brother James to the throne and the exclusionists who opposed it generated new political targets. The lapsing of the Licensing Act in 1693 ended pre-publication censorship and at the same time opened the doors to a new breed of writers, so-called Grub Street hacks, who anonymously penned pamphlets, libels, and news, much to the dismay of those learned authors who despised the prolific swarm of dunces. At the same time, the interest in classical antiquities inspired translations and imitations of the ancient satirists. So what does satire mean? And what did it mean to writers of the Restoration and early 18th century, such as John Dryden, whose satires in 1693 provided a definition that would inform the writers of this period? The term comes from classical Latin satura or satira, meaning full dish, and later meaning a dish with a variety of fruit or food made from many different ingredients. By around 150 BCE, it meant mixed dish, and as such, it meant medley or miscellany, and also was applied to collections of miscellaneous poems written by the ancient Roman poets Ennius, Prasuvius, and Lucilius, who in turn influenced Horace, Juvenal, and Menippus, the ancient Roman poets who give their names to the three main categories of satire we continue to recognize today. Lucilius was seen as the inventor of satire. His comic, biting, invective poems, obscene, moralizing, mocking, and indignant provided defining features of the genre. His practice of writing verse in hexameter was later followed by Horace, Perseus, and Juvenal in their own satires. Satire eventually evolved to mean, as we use it today, a genre or a mode of expression in any work of art that exposes the vices, immorality, foolishness, and other shortcomings of individuals, institutions, or societies to ridicule and scorn. Satire during the long 18th century had traces of these meanings, but the genre also had quite specific and yet unstable and transforming definitions during the period. In English, satire was associated with the mythological satyr, from the mistaken view that the term was derived from the ancient Greek chorus of satyrs in satyr plays. These were body burlesques of mythical stories that were performed after a trilogy of tragedies in ancient Greek theater. Well into the 18th century, the satyr, rude, coarse, and uncouth, personified censoriousness or critique and was explicitly associated with satire. This image is from the frontispiece of Samuel Butler's Hudibras, printed in 1726. It shows a relief being carved in which a satyr drives a chariot drawn by Hudibras and Ralpho. 
The satyr is turned back to whip figures of rebellion, hypocrisy, and ignorance dressed as Puritans. On the left, a satyr holds up a volume of Hudibras as a guide for the carver. Long after the etymological correction had been accepted, the satyr continued to be associated with satire. This 1732 image is from a series in which the engraver has copied the scenes from William Hogarth's Harvard's Progress and added a framing device of grinning satyrs. This frontispiece, depicting a female satyr, is from 1788 and is a much gentler version of a mythological beast, which perhaps reflects the changing taste in satire through the period. The definitions in 17th century dictionaries tended to emphasize the roughness and coarseness inherent in the mistaken assumption that the etymological roots of the term were in the Greek satyrs. For example, a satire was defined as a nipping kind of poesy or a nipping and scoffing verse, or as Joshua Poole described it, girding, biting, snarling, scourging, jerking, lashing, smarting, sharp, tart, invective, rough, censorious, courage, snappish, captious, barking, brawling, carping, fanged, sharp toothed, quipping, jeering, flouting, sullen, rigid, impartial, whipping, thorny, pricking, stinging, sharp, fanged, injurious, reproachful, libelous, harsh, rough hewn, odious, opprobrious, contumelious, defaming, calumnious. And you will note in Elisha Cole's definition that it is both a hairy monster like the horned man with goat's feet and also an invective poem. 18th century definitions tended to emphasize the purpose of satire, that is, to censure vice and vicious persons and folly. Samuel Johnson's definition of 1755, for example, emphasized that the word does not come from satyr, and he differentiated between satire and lampoons, which were directed at a specific person, though he noted they are too frequently confounded. The changing theory and practice of satire had been reflected earlier in the century in Richard Steele's Tatler of 1709, where he took care to emphasize satire's moral purpose, distinctly opposed to the baseness of mere libel. In the character of the fictitious Isaac Bickerstaff, he wrote, We reject many eminent virtues if they are accompanied with one apparent weakness. The reflecting after this manner made me account for the strange delight men take in reading lampoons and scandal. I find it is principally for this reason that the worst of mankind, the libelers, receive so much encouragement. The low race of men take a secret pleasure in finding an eminent character leveled to their condition by a report of its defects. The libeler falls in with this humor and gratifies this baseness of temper, which is naturally an enemy to extraordinary merit. It is from this that libel and satire are promiscuously joined together in the notions of the vulgar, though the satirist and the libeler differ as much as the magistrate and the murderer. I would like to turn now to the three main types of satire that we encounter in 17th and 18th century literature. The first is horation. This is a gentle, sometimes self-deprecating, indulgent, tolerant, comic social commentary. An example of Horatian satire is Alexander Pope's The Rape of the Lock. Then we find Juvenalian. This presents a dark view of human vices, a denunciation or condemnation, and expresses indignation, anger, and outrage. Examples of this type are Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal, and some critics include Gulliver's travels in this type. John Dennis, in a letter to Matthew Pryor upon the Roman satirists, characterized these two types as follows. Horace argues, insinuates, engages, rallies, smiles. Juvenal exclaims, apostrophizes, exaggerates, lashes, stabs. 
There is in Horace almost everywhere an agreeable mixture of good sense and of true pleasantry, so that he has everywhere the principal qualities of an excellent comic poet. And there is almost everywhere in Juvenal anger, indignation, rage, disdain, and the violent emotions and vehement style of tragedy. The third type of satire, Manipian, also called Veronian, is a humorous work of social commentary characterized by light intellectual comedy and gentle ridicule. It can be as stinging as Juvenalian satire, but is less aggressive. Howard Weinbrot, in his Manipian Satire Reconsidered, defines it as a form that uses at least two other genres, languages, cultures, or changes of voice to oppose a dangerous, false, or specious and threatening orthodoxy. Examples include John Dryden's Mac Flecknoe, Alexander Pope's The Dunciad. Some critics include Lawrence Stern's Tristram Shandy in this type, while Weinbrot explicitly excludes it, and some critics include Gulliver's Travels. So what did these writers think the function of their satires was? English bishop, moral philosopher, and satirist Joseph Hall wrote the first English satire successfully modeled on Latin satire, Virgita Merium, six books. The Latin title, literally, A Harvest of Birches, alludes to the small bundle of birch rods used for scourging, a suggestion that Hall's satires were rods for beating miscreants. He wrote, the satire should be like a porcupine, that shoots sharp quills out in each angry line and wounds the blushing cheek and fiery eye of him that hears and readeth guiltily. Sir Carr Scroop wrote in his Defense of Satire in 1676, and without doubt, though some it may offend, nothing helps more than satire to amend ill manners or is truly a virtue's friend. Princes may laws ordain, priests gravely preach, but poets most successfully will teach. For as a passing bell frights from his meat the greedy sick man that would too much eat, so when a vice ridiculous is made, our neighbor's shame keeps us from growing bad. Jonathan Swift, in his apology to the tale of a tub in 1704, wrote, why should any clergyman of our church be angry to see the follies of fanaticism and superstition exposed, though in the most ridiculous manner? Since that is perhaps the most probable way to cure them, or at least to hinder them from further spreading. Swift also wrote in his verses on the death of Dr. Swift, DSPD, which was written in 1731 and published in 1739. As with a moral view designed to cure the vices of mankind, his vein, ironically grave, exposed the fool and lashed the knave. Yet malice never was his aim. He lashed the vice but spared the name. No individual could resent where thousands equally were meant. His satire points at no defect but what all mortals may correct. As these quotations show, satire often claims to reform social or political vice, but is there any evidence that it ever did so? Does satire function to expose folly and vice and thus to elicit reform? Or does it in fact tend to reinforce and entrench destructive ideologies through its savage attacks on people or events that have displeased the author? Consider, for example, John Gay's The Beggar's Opera. Jonathan Swift observed that the play had placed all kinds of vice in the strongest and most odious light. But as Samuel Johnson later reasoned, the piece, like many others, was plainly written only to divert, without any moral purpose, and is therefore not likely to do good. Nor can it be conceived without more speculation than life requires or admits to be productive of much evil. 
The function of satire, then, might be supposed to be exposing, challenging, and critiquing folly, vice, misuses of power, and so on, maybe even pricking the consciences of the corrupt. But when we also consider the question of the morality of satire, we might conclude that it is a mistake to think of it only as the indignant lash seeking moral correction. The satirists of the Restoration and early 18th century British scene may target bad people with bad thinking, but they also register a complex aggression of their own, a destructive impulse, and sometimes even a need for disorder. And so I will leave you with these questions. Does satire's lash point to an aloof ground of higher principle, or does it sometimes try to destroy the whole house? Moreover, do readers like watching satirists abusing other people? Is, in fact, one of satire's appeals our own taste for blood? <laughs>